or at least press record. Uh, any questions uh, today? As goes past every time the semester, less and less people sometimes uh, unblock their cameras. But if, like I said, if you are able to, even though you know that I'm recording this, if you're uncomfortable with that, that's fine. But if you have no other reason to worry about it and you're not wanted by local or state or federal or international law enforcement, then I, <laughs> I encourage you to unblock your camera. I don't even think I'm looking at a full screen here and we've got 56 people. So do your part to win something. I don't know your education. All right, anyway, uh, for the paper, do you want to be single spaced or double spaced? Uh, which paper, Gracie, are you talking about the content assignment due for Friday? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, for Friday's content assignment, doesn't matter to me whether you type in um, single space or double space. I do have that as a requirement, single space for the big paper. Uh, because I just think that that's those parameters could get out of control and I need a minimum and blah, 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 blah. So, yep, for Friday's content assignment. How are you doing today, broski? <laughs> broski, uh, my brother, brother man, bruh, what's up, hang loose? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm great. Great. So this is my one class that asks me that. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to report today. Today's fantastic. I ran 10 hills biked 20 miles, um, teaching seven classes. I have one class that starts in another few weeks. Um, the guy who fixed the side of my house so that the roof is no longer open to raccoons that might want to live in it or the weather. I owe that guy. Got to pay that guy some money today. How are the doggies? My, uh, my pit bull bailed because she's such a chill dog that when I start to talk at a higher level, she's like, mm, nope, going upstairs to the bedroom. She's like a low action, low key dog. Uh, Huckle is, is good, he's right here chilling. There he is, Catahoo and Boba. She's back there on the pillow, see her too. Boba Fett, that's right. Uh, doggies are good. Um, Lauren, can we write about anything for the, yeah, sorry, I didn't include a prompt for chicken people because I just want you to respond and react to it. Now, if when you're writing your first posts, you want to like make some kind of connection, I mean, we are talking about culture right now. And so you'll have a lot of the information from chapter three. Um, you already have access to my slides. So maybe you want to talk about the subculture of chicken people. Uh, excuse me, I'm having a delicious drink. Um, something like that. But yeah, write about your reactions, write about what surprised you about it, maybe a sociological connection. How long should chicken people be? You know, a, a substantive post. Don't write like two or three sentences and think that's good enough for your first post. You know, like make a nice post. I don't know, a few paragraphs. Um, and for the content assignment, I said about half a page. You know, you, you're not doing an introduction and a like conclusion for each individual question, but you're just writing a complete essay. So yeah, that's all right. Nope, don't worry. Uh, okay, good. All right. Um, I actually, I'm fine answering uh, questions just to make sure that people have clarification. Um, and then there's a certain point that I'll be like, yeah, we're done with this. All right. Okay. So uh, top hat is not required. Nope. Although if I just put some questions up today and we might get to some of them. So if you're just realizing that log into top hat, answer those questions really quick. You could, you could do that now. That'd be fantastic. Um, no, you don't need an introductory and a summary for each question because these are just three or four or five. Not sure how many. I can't remember essay questions. Is there a kitty? Yeah. Are you, expect, are you expecting a formal citation on the content assignment for the book? Always. Like on the end? Always. Okay. Yep. And within. Like, and mm -hmm. I do think I have something about citations. Every single question for content assignment needs a textbook, at least a citation, if not more. The textbook is required, so you don't need to look around the internet. You can take and copy and paste that question and get a bunch of answers for it on the internet, but I need you to use the textbook, which we know is solid information, a solid source, and then at the end, you will have an end citation. Yep, and sometimes people go outside of the textbook, so that's fine too. Mm. But primarily stick with the textbook. Good question. Made myself like a cranberry lemonade today. Plus what else I may have thrown in there, who knows? I ran out of coffee this morning. So at this point, anything goes, I'm an adult. All right, uh, when, the, when the book was talking about, I'm just kidding. 
Uh, when the book was talking about countercultures, I was wondering how it would look at Rump Springa in the Amish culture, since Amish primarily reject the American. Uh, rump, what is Rump's, Rump Springa? So in the Amish culture, Rump Spr rum Springa is like where they leave like the Amish community and go out into like the modern world and kind of like experience it. Drive a car, like, go to Walmart. What? They go out and like live in the modern world for like two years. I didn't know that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, that that do they still do that? Yeah, it's still practiced. Wow. Um, I was in uh, Iowa where I got my undergraduate at Luther College, and so there was a lot of Amish in that north uh, eastern corner of uh, Iowa. And so frequently you would see like two or three buggies outside of the Walmart, you know, so there was like some kind of contact and getting up supplies. It's modern day. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, that's, that, that's interesting. I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, though I think that's, though I think it's very interesting and a great segue, Lindsay, into today's lecture. Hey, good job. <laughs> All right. Let me go ahead and do a screen share here really quick. And I guess I'm going to actually, before I do that, let me, um, let me ask this question because uh, we it brought it up the other day, but I skipped over it. And <clears throat> that is, if you have complete freedom to choose, would you rather live in the United States for the rest of your life? As we're talking about culture, right? Reminder, chapter three on culture. Or would you rather live in some other country? So uh, 73 respondents, 18 said live in the U.S., 36 said somewhere else, and 19 said not sure. So what did you choose and why? There's a question that I ask every semester, so I've heard a lot of different answers, but. Um, I chose what I did because. What did you choose? Um, like I, <laughs> um, I chose to like live somebody live somewhere else, and I chose that because I haven't experienced the world yet. I feel like it'd be cool to like go out there and see what everybody else is about. Awesome. Good. Uh, who else? Chose to live in another country because I've lived in another country. Oh, preferred living there in the United States. There you go. Uh, Julia, are you willing to unmute your mic uh, at least and say uh, where that was or what that experience was without typing? Hmm. Cool. <laughs> um, That's I, I, I don't have um, the question response thing. Like, talk, That's fine. But, um, if I, if I were to do it, I think I'd probably live somewhere else on the basis that like I've already lived here for so long and like getting those new experiences and like meeting more people like would probably be a lot better. And on top of that, I just think that like a lot of other countries like just have like slightly better like structures than ours personally. Um, that's just like my opinion. Social safety nets like Yes, and and education. I think that a lot of countries go farther than us in education, and I would just want like what's best for my future children. Awesome. Yeah, uh, definitely some places out there with fantastic education, fantastic healthcare. I mean, really, you know, depending. And of, of course, you know, traveling right now, obviously, it's sort of changed that notion uh, quite a bit. Although some people are still traveling a lot of places. I mean, now is not the time necessarily. So that's a whole other, I guess, consideration of this. Um, I would want to live somewhere else due to travel being easier uh, because it's nice to experience another country. No, don't know, but it's kind of scary to leave the norm for sure. Yeah, if you've spent your entire life uh, here, then yeah, I think that a lot of people, there's a lot of culture culture shock and change that comes with that. Oh, nope, you don't get to get up here. This is Ziggy Marley. He's just about to jump up on the computer. What's up, Ziggy? Say hi. This guy's like 15 years old and he's still rocking. Oh. All right. <laughs> Got lots of animals. It's a farm. Okay, good. Anybody else who want to chime in? Uh, why you would want to live here? Why you would want to stay here? Or wanna, why would you want to live someplace else? I guess since no one else answered uh, to choose to live in the U.S., I feel like, you know, you already know everything about the country and you speak that language, especially. It's hard to pick up another language. And I mean, we have football too. No one else has American football. <laughs> Right on, all, all valid reasons. Um, language is a big deal for sure. Um, you know, and of course I'm a huge proponent uh, of bilingual education being mandatory 
uh, because there's just so many NBA players that speak four or five or six languages. We know that it really helps with brain development, but if you haven't started doing that, it does appear to be more difficult the later on in life you do it. So yeah, language not being a barrier is a big deal. Good, good. All right. And then lastly here I had, do you believe, before I jump to the, uh, the lecture, do you believe that U.S. culture is superior to that of most other countries? Two people said yes. 61 people said no. 10 said not sure. So I'm not really sure that that gives us any data one way or the other that's very important. But, um, you know, just to, something to consider as I'm asking questions about, uh, you know, everywhere in the world. Okay. Talked about that. Um, all right. So I think the last thing we got to was material culture. And we were talking about binkies and important stuff like that. Uh, but what's the difference between the terms culture and society? So a lot of times, and there is a difference, right? But we use, we use terms like this interchangeably all the time in culture, right? We use uh, drugs and alcohol, but we, we know that alcohol is a drug, right? Race and ethnicity. So oftentimes we are saying the same thing or we, we mean the same thing, but, but the terms are different. And, and this is true with culture and society. So culture, a shared way of life or social heritage, and it shapes what we do and helps form our personalities. You know, there's a lot, uh, and we'll look not in this chapter, but in the chapter on socialization, we'll look just how important socialization is. Um, and so even if it's very, 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 very young and you're just absorbing the culture around you, your experience is very different in it and it does shape your personality. And we'll talk about that in future chapters. And then society. So culture is that shared way of life. And society is the people who interact in that defined territory that share that culture, right? Both of these are, you know, fair game, good 100 test questions, pretty straightforward. Um, and I'm not trying to sort of reduce it to that, but if I see something, you know that by now I'll say, hey, you know, that's oftentimes on the test. So the difference between culture and society. So a shared way of life, I really think that's the best way to describe it. That's how you can I'd say you can be, a, we could be a very multicultural society, you know, and still share so many things. Like people can be so different, but we are here in this society and that culture, we, it is shared, right? Oh, wow. I just keep getting more and more into that poet, Amanda Gorman. Like I can't get, I can't get enough. And do you know that she's reading poetry at the Super Bowl? Like, like, let me just tell you how incredible it is that part of the halftime, and I know that, look, look, life is strange enough over the last year, but you're going to tell me that somebody is, you're going to have a poet reading poetry at the Super Bowl. That is one of the coolest things, maybe since Prince playing the Super Bowl. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, kiss. All right. So neither society nor culture could exist without, without the other. Okay. So we get the idea that although they're different, there's an interplay here, right? Okay. So I asked this question um, and I just read off the answer to that. Do you believe the United States is a culture superior to that of most other countries? Uh, two for yes, most in the middle there for no and a few not sure. Um, I don't even know what that means. I, I, I asked that question to get like a macro level perspective of where we're at. Cause there's like, you know, pride for your country and then there's nationalism, you know what I mean? And so that's a really big spectrum. So I just answer this because I mean, I think it's kind of a weird question to ask, like I said, to begin with. What does superior mean? Well, maybe it means, do we make more money? Do we have a bigger army? What's our health? But it could mean, what's our healthcare system look like? Do we take care of the elderly? Um, how you define your culture as superior uh, or not, or in what ways it is defined, is, it differs, right, from culture to culture. So we create culture. And, you know, it's important to understand some differences that we'll talk about throughout the course of the semester uh, between you know, human behavior and animal behavior. And only humans rely on culture rather than instinct as far as ensuring our survival, right? Like out of the gate. And, and, and we'll talk about that. Oh, wow. Ooh, we've, okay. We have just gotten to the sexiest part of the whole semester. I don't even know if I wore my best out. I'm gonna have to stand up for this. Okay, I'm gonna stop, stop the share here. All right, all right. Now, uh, before I do this, I'm going to step back from the camera so that you can see my whole body. Before I do this, I just, I want to warn, I want to warn people 
all right, ahead of time that what I'm going to do, you're all adults here. So if you don't want to look, I do this in a classroom too. Okay. If you don't want to look, you don't have to. I'm going to present some pretty, he's not wearing pants. I'm getting to that. All right. Anyway, we're going to, not that, but we're, get, we're getting this. It's highly sexualized. You're all adults. So if you feel that you want to look away, please do. Now, I'm going to show you something that absolutely, absolutely drove people crazy with sexual passion and desire and people would faint. Okay. And here we, okay, here we go. Um, you've been warned. Okay. And we're all adults here. No, no calling Joyce about this. We're, we're all adults. Okay. All right. I got to limber up first. I'm four. I'm 47. I got to limber up first. Just get ready. Get ready. It's going to, all right, here we go. Here we go. All right. All right. Is it working? I don't know. I'm, hold on. Let me try it. Let me try it with this leg. No, is it? I don't think, I think something's going wrong. Hold on. Try it out. Oh, I don't want to throw some. I don't want to throw something out. Um, okay, I, apparently this isn't working. I'm, I'm not hearing people screaming. I haven't seen anybody faint yet. I'll go back. I'll try it one more. I'll try it one more time. <laughs> no. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, so, I mean, I don't know what's going on here because you just saw, right? You just saw the slide. And the side, that's that is now now that some of you can look you can look back now okay it's safe it's safe right I promised you an exciting class let's see how many views this gets on the internet sexiest thing ever but why not what happened is it me is it that I'm 47 I have new I have jeans I just lost, I've lost 25 pounds I'm wearing some jeans today that I haven't worn since COVID started I'm feeling good. Um, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you the difference, I guess. When Elvis did that in 1950, he was only showed from the waist up because white America literally thought that he was, that every single white woman was going to pass out and die and instantly learn what sex was. And all of a sudden that would be the end of everything. And I, if you think I'm joking, I'm saying that they wouldn't show him from the waist down and I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not as good as Elvis, but I'm pretty sure he was just like shaking his leg and singing a song and people were pretty much freaking out. So, although, oh, that's right. OMG, scandalous knees. Well, apparently it's not the 1950s anymore. Oh, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'll just have to try something different next semester. Just wait till the chapter on deviants and hope that, uh, hope that my leather isn't at the, uh, at the uh, dry cleaner. All right. All right. Let me screen back to our screen share and get to the So the question is, does culture stay stagnant? I mean, is culture stagnant? Does it stay the same? You'd already know the answer to that. Obviously, everybody just proved by their reaction that I'm afraid nobody's going to be telling Joyce McConnell about what I did on Zoom and this won't make national news because that was pretty boring. But in 1950s, that was wild. But then all of a sudden, fast forward to the 1980s down there and take a look at Axl Rose. Most, this is a lot of clothes for Axl. You have to understand that when Axl's performing, it's mostly like a headband and hot pants and tennis shoes. And then somebody says something to him in the audience and there's like a whole clip on YouTube of him just jumping into the audience and like to fight people in his hot pants. Anyway, uh, I would say that that's a pretty big difference, right? So I asked this question, let me go ahead, back here and exit out of this <laughs> shrink that down for a minute i told julie i said this is my big sexy day she knows every semester and then like, every semester turns out to not be the case all right um what are some differences between 1950s culture or culture today and culture in the 1950s now a lot of people chimed in online but rather rather than read those off let's just we're going to get into a discussion here because that's how i'd like to do it what do you think what's different now right let's see we can even imagine that we're sitting in a classroom like normal normal whatever that is um so no more tupperware parties that might be different what do you think unmute your mic go ahead what's different between now and the 1950s this is random but um 
in the 1950s, they had like socialite clubs, especially for women in high schools. And like my, my grandmother was actually a part of that. And it's just so weird to me that like they had, it was, it was literally like sororities, but in high schools. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Good. So yeah, way different for sure. There's still clubs, but, but not, not the same, not like that. Right. Um, what else? Uh, what's different between the 1950s? And you're just making a guess. You've absorbed some of this culture. You could, you know, reference back movies or your parents or somebody. I don't know. What do you think? I said like family values. So like the woman's role in a family is much different. How is that? How is that different? Well, I mean, I wasn't alive in the 1950s, so I don't have like a personal experience, but I do know what I've read, what I've learned. And during the 1950s, a woman was expected to stay home, cook, clean, have children, take care of children, be a good wife. Like it was about being a wife. And now it's much more like about careers, learning, at least in America, I can't say like in every country that's so, but in America, it is more focused on education and career and children. Yeah. And you bring up something really, really good right away, gender roles, right? Mm -hmm. and, and particularly, you know, things, so many, I think things are so different. Should I do this other thing that I was going to do today? This might be the most exciting day of the semester. Should I do it? Should I, I need to see some nods and some heads. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, you don't even know what I'm going to do yet. So you're just like, do it. All right, here's what I'm going to do. Let's, uh, let's send it. Let's see how different things are. Let's send a 1950s text to my partner, Julie. Let's see. I haven't done this before, but it just struck me as like a really good idea <clears throat> to find out like just what are the real life differences, right? So let's, I'll talk it because I talk a microphone in. Yes. Can't, well, I can't really show you what she said, but this is this is Julie's. Trust me, um, she's upstairs doing her art. Okay, she's like upstairs drawing. So here we go. Don't don't make any noise. Julie, when I'm done with school today, I need you to pick up the boys so I can rest. Period. When you bring them home, comma, I would like you to have dinner on the table by 5 p.m because my teaching job has tired me out and as man of the house, I deserve a break, period. Also, I love you, but I'm not asking. All right, <laughs> You're, you are a dead man. Oh no, you, you, I mean, divorce, really? Is it that different? But okay, do I send it? <laughs> do it, you? Yes or no? Unmute. No. Un no. Yes. No. 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 I'm doing it. Wait, send it. I sent it. That's right. We've been together 25 years, so I'm just going to bet on that. going to hope for that. Okay. Full set. <laughs> yep. Verified. Okay. I would never turn my phone up, but I'll turn my phone up now. Okay. So while I was doing that, I'm looking at your faces. And I just think that we figured out what are some of the differences in gender between people who identify as the gender male and the gender female and how those things interact or don't. So we shall, we shall find out. I have a yes, oh no, divorce, yes, full send. Of course, if anything happens, are we witness to a murder? I'm recording. That's, the, that's, uh, that's all at this point I think I can rely on. Okay, what else is different? What else is different if we're sitting in the classroom with gender? Let's say we're in the classroom at CSU, look to your left, look to your right, look at who's in class, what's going on, what is different? There's a lot more females here than there would be back then. Yeah, and, and to the tune of my, maybe none, right? I mean, this is college, and I think my great, my grandma or my great grandma was the first to get a degree in Iowa State in, um, uh oh, hold on. Somebody's she might be typing something. Hold on, listen. Uh, to get a degree in um, home economics, that was what that was the degree that they offered. And and so okay, so not as many people who identify as gender female would actually be uh, in class. What else? What would you be wearing if you were in class? Um, you dress very conservatively as a woman. What do people wear all the time, people who identify as gender female in class today 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, that, that would not have been that way in 1940 or 50. Yeah, no pants. Yep. Yeah, it would have been a dress, something like that, right? Um, yeah, somebody said, weird rant thought, please excuse me. Is it kind of weird that we had a boys and girls line in elementary school, even though we we're going to the same place? Actually, if you look at old school buildings, one side of the building was the girls' entrance, and one side of the building was the boys' entrance. And of course, yes, we're leaving out the fact that this is long before we thought in, in like terms outside of a binary gender construct to be sure, right? Okay, good. Um, nothing, nothing yet on the phones, the eerie silence maybe, I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay, so what else is different between the 1950s and now is we're proving that culture is not stagnant. Um, I would say gender roles are more of like up in the air, um, like, like it's more okay for women to wear the pants in a relationship and be like, I'm in charge. This is what we're doing. Like I'm making the money. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think relationship roles have changed drastically. And of course you're going from one income. Uh Oh, here we go. All right. Here we go. I was, let's see some people cracking some smiles. Oh no, that was, Oh, that was something else. <laughs> Now, every, now until the end of class, if anybody gets a hold of me, I'll be like, ah, ah. Um, yeah, good. So, so many things besides just traditional gender roles, like people having, and then, you know, who's raising, who's raising the family and what does birthing look like and all of that, right? Relationship expectations. Men are always supposed to pursue the woman, pay all the bills and provide for their whole life. Yeah, I would say that that has been identified by my students in recent years as, as uh, massively changing. Um, Political culture alone, as well as foreign affairs. Yeah, yep, big deal, Cold War. Sure, more uh, accepting of diversity I have here. Uh, gender roles, careers, uh, civil rights, women's rights and opportunities, conformity. Oh yeah, conformity. I was gonna say sexuality too. Like um, acceptance of like more sexualities, like it's a lot less taboo, like stuff like that. Yeah, and remember, we're making a comparison to like 2020 in 1950. And that's 70 years. I mean, things change a lot in five or 10 years, right? Um, yeah, back then, president came on TV, everybody sat down and watched that. People were always expected to look their best when they went out in public. Yeah, people were not making a trip to King Supers in their jammies, or class for that matter. Although, I just want you to know that class in your pajamas, I have nothing against that. I think I showed up to class in pajamas plenty. Stigma against mental health has decreased. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, always here for that generation. He was like, dad, you listened, uh, right? Good. Uh, excellent. So look, so many things in a small amount of time, so much so that we know just how drastic that is. If we're looking at the full 70 years, not only judging by my text, but all the things that we've listed and, and what we know about, uh, our changing culture. Okay. Let me get back here and I will screen share this again. All right. Okay. And fear of communism and preservation of the classic American family to protect against it. Yeah. And, and I mean, so many things have changed and, and are like, can be considered much better in ways and still a long way to go. Right. I mean, that is the story of this culture of, of this society. Um, a lot of work to do still, even though in many ways it's uh, it's better. Yeah, red scares. There's a lot of scares throughout history. Okay, so here we go. Good test question. There are four common components that all cultures share. I will ask you this almost undoubtedly. Um, and although they vary greatly uh, from society to society, uh, we know that, you know, we know that these are the four that are the same across the board. Symbols, language, values, and norm. Hey, norm. Uh, if you're a fan of Cheers or ever watched that sitcom. Uh, so we're going to break these down and let's look at the first ones here. Um, all right. So symbols and gestures, anything that carries a particular meaning recognized by people who share a culture, anything meaningful that represents something else. Uh, list, some, list some symbols quick. Unmute your mic. Name a symbol in this culture. Peace sign. Peace sign, yeah. And, okay, right out of the gate, 
any, and it changes, right? Because, because meaning differs from culture to culture I have down here and also within a single society. And from time to time, since you brought up this one, it's one of my favorite gestures to tell somebody, hey, peace. But what did this mean originally? Who used that symbol? And, and I'm not talking like 100,000 years ago, but within modern history, who used that symbol for something very different before the anti-war movement sort of co-opted it in the 1960s? Ooh, good, good trivia question for anybody out there. I get, you can unmute your mic if you have a, a Nixon. No, sorry, not let me say no. But. Well, Nixon did do that, but he's referencing something else that I was thinking of. Lindsay, go ahead. Didn't it mean like the equivalent of the middle finger in like one of the, I can't remember which country, but in a different In, in some Middle Eastern countries and some other places, the thumbs up does. Thumbs up is very much that. A reverse peace sign might do that too. Um, but I'm thinking of, and if I don't see this last chat thing, rock and roll, no, um, I think it was a uh, World War Churchill. In World War II, this was used as V for victory, right? Most people know it now. And that's what, and that's the weird thing. If you see Nixon leaving after he resigned, after, you know, impeachment, why he's giving V for victory, I have no idea because, right, you're out of there, buddy. But same thing that Churchill was doing. Now imagine taking a war symbol and then turning it around to be like a very important cultural symbol that represents peace in the anti-war movement. So something like that, that's one of the, the ways that I love how things can change over time um, and from culture to culture or within a culture. So what else, name some symbols. We won't break everyone down like that. But that just has an interesting history to it. Handshakes. Handshakes, yep. What else? Thumbs up. Thumbs up, sure. What are some other symbols that you see all the time? High fives. Yep. Swastika. Oh, yep. What else? Cross. Absolutely. Uh, the apple, apple, right? When I'm in like class and there's 150 or 200 laptop tops up like think of all the stickers that you have think of all the breweries think of all the right you know all the symbols the, the golden arches any any of that stuff that we recognize you know and and know the meaning behind it right so my question is how do you know what they mean society well be specific like how you know how, how do we know what the golden arches mean or an apple logo or a handshake or a high five? You've associated them with something? We have because you've learned it. Yeah, absolutely. You've absorbed that and, and you've either been taught that consciously or you've been taught that unconsciously. You've seen it. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't go fast food ever. So that when my mom, like when, when we went to a McDonald's or something like that, or ever did a happy meal, this is back even before McDonald's was poison. Um, but, but it was like a big deal. And I remember seeing the golden arches. And when you're, you know, I think when we're driving on the highway and you like see like the next rest stop and all they have is like the, you know, the squares. I think before I were to read any of those squares, I recognize all those symbols first, right? You know, oftentimes anyway. Let me see this chat here. Uh, uh, Statue of Liberty, middle finger, yes, praying. Okay, so let's look at this. I'm gonna look at a few symbols. We're gonna look at this, this, and this, okay? So let me stop the screen share now and head back to uh, the intern, intranet and top hat. And okay. What does this symbol mean to you? And it's the golden arches or the McDonald's arches. I don't know if anybody calls them the golden arches anymore. Um, question A was yum. 42 people said yum. 23 people said hell no. And six people said C. I don't know what that means. So uh, there's an example of a symbol in culture. And some people are like, ooh, yeah. And some people are like, that's, I'm sorry, that's not food. And other people are like, oh, it most certainly is, right? That's two all these spaghetti, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. No, I was programmed in this society, all sorts of advertising. Okay, let me see, next question. What does the middle 
light. This is hilarious. What does the middle light in a stoplight mean? Now, let me just tell you that when I reveal this every semester, this brings us to yet another dimension of symbolic meaning. And I think you have an idea already because people are laughing. Now, now you know that there's a right answer for this, correct? You know, and a lot of you just got your license within the last like decade. I'll be nice, right? You, you just got your license within the last decade, maybe some within the last four or five years. So you know that that light means one thing. It means slow down. Right? It, that's absolutely what it means. So let's see how the class answered. Two people said stop. 29 people said slow down. 39 people said go faster, quick. <laughs> so, okay, now somebody explain this to me. If we know, if we know that this is the case, even if five people answered that. And normally, I think because I had a right answer this time around, so maybe like people tried the different answer. I have no idea. Normally, this is overwhelmingly people say speed up. But if we know that this means slow down, be safe, what are the rules then that we have adapted to as human beings to get around that? What driving rules do you have? See, this is the fun part of sociology. What do you do if you go through a yellow light? We have a whole set of, we have a list of things we even have to do. Yep. Did somebody just do this? Maddie? Did you do that? Yeah. Right. So what's that? Somebody, somebody unmute your mic and tell me what is, what's hitting the, what's, what's touching the ceiling mean? It's like the game where like, if you go through a yellow light, you hit the top and then like the last per if you play it the way my friends and I play it sometimes, <laughs> the last person to hit it takes off an article of clothing. Wow. You have way more interesting friends than I oh, people are shaking their heads. Okay, so this, okay, so not only have I played this game, but I didn't know there was repercussions for it. I certainly didn't know it was like a modern strip poker through town. I mean, if that was the case, ooh, with my driving through Fort Collins, I mean, I could be barely clothed by the time I get home. That's awful. Nobody needs that. All right, but so, so check it out. So we, we have this rule. So if you speed up, what, why? I think there's some legitimate reasons too, right? So the rule is you have a front uh, or you have front half of your vehicle in the intersection, the red light, then they can't ticket you, All right? Okay, so it's not, not a punishment to go through a yellow, but I feel like yellow becomes red, Tuesday becomes Wednesday. Okay, so what is another, th this is hilarious. So I, I, I got a ticket, not me, but I opened it up once and it had Julie, right? She had gone through one of those lights like on Drake or whatever it is in college. And it had a picture of her. And in the picture, she's smiling and touching her roof, right? So, so I got the piece of mail. So she comes home and I'm like, so you drive pretty safe through town, right? And she's like, yeah, always. And I'm like, you'd never run a red light, would you? She's like, no. And I'm like, cause I mean, we don't have a lot of money. We want to say that would be bad for our insurance. She's like, yeah, never. And I'm like, then what was this right here? You know, and of course I was joking, but there's her like celebrating going through the light. So we have a whole set of rules. So, so taking clothes off, is there another set of rules for that besides clothes? Is like punch somebody in the car or is there like, what else is the thing? I mean, the punching someone for me is like, um, like punch buggy. Like if you see like a, a car, you like punch someone and then you say the name, like the color of the car. So they can't do the same car. That sounds like a version of slug bug. Right? Something like that. Like slug that people used to do that for V dubs. Thing. Okay. Is so what else is anybody? It, so, so some students, I think it's a safety thing, right? You don't want to have to slam on your brakes. <laughs> Padiddle. Yep. So look at all these like weird driving things that fall somewhere within reality and not reality of the rules of the road that we apply. Um, so uh, I have, I definitely, I think that there's another way around this now. Does anybody know what it is? Does anybody know the easy way around red light stuff these days that I just thought I just figured out the other day? <laughs> Anybody? Because humans will always, that's why I study sociology. Humans will always find a different way to do things. Um, my friend got one of those tickets in the mail and they were wearing their mask. And he's like, yeah, that was my car, but you can't prove it was me. And I was like, oh, and now am I going to start blowing off lights all over town with a mask on? 
Is that gonna, is that gonna be my new thing? I hope not. I'm not telling you to do that. Nobody do that. All right, let me look at the next one. The next one and last one is, what does this symbol mean to you? And the symbol is a Confederate flag uh, or what has been sort of taken as the Confederate flag. And the answers were seven for Southern pride, 50 for racist ideology, four for Leonard Skinner, and 11 for get over it, you lost, the South lost like a long time ago. All right, these are all examples. And like, even if it comes something like, like the Confederate flag, which I see it and immediately, I'm kind of inclined to be like, get over it. That being said, do I think that everybody that wears that flag on like a Leonard Skinner shirt who went to like a rock and roll show because they like three guitars in one band is a racist? I don't, you know, I really don't. I think that there are other ways uh, and other perspectives with which to look at it, even if I'm sort of inclined myself to feel that way, right? Um, so uh, somebody said it means racism straight up. Anyway, right, so to a lot of us, so that's just an idea like how even looking at something like that, I mean, I'm probably not gonna change my mind, but I also can't think that every time that I see that in, in or out of context that, that it maybe does mean that, um, which I think would be probably uh, you know, pretty big assumption of itself as well. All right, let me flip back to the screen share. And we have a few more minutes here. Uh, okay, so. Now, anybody, what does this symbol mean? Um, from what I've heard, if you fly the flag upside down, it means that like you're in trouble or something, something like that. Yeah, distress or trouble. It's an actually, a fil officially, I think a, a, a military use for that symbol would be to fly the flag upside down if you needed help or if there was some sort of, you know, like I said, I guess trouble or distress, you know, SOS, I guess somebody said is another one. So symbolic meaning differs from culture to culture and also within a given or within a single society greatly. I mean, some, look, you have to understand, like nowadays, let me tell you what's different about the 4th of July from before I was born to now. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, if you put a version of the American flag on your bikini or on your pants and sat on it or anything like that, a patch or anything like that, you could get your ass kicked. Like that was a way of outwardly disrespecting the flag. Nowadays, if you like look at like the 4th of July, I mean, it's, it's everything has a flag on it from the paddle boat that you have or the paddle board to your bikini to your flags to your, so, you know, we have rules and sometimes they're really, really serious. When I was a kid, everybody put their flag out all the time, every morning in the neighborhood. And then like people just stop doing that. Um, but it changes over time. And I don't, wouldn't expect that if somebody wore a flag t-shirt or put a big flag and flew it around their truck, you know, and drove all over the place. I, I mean, like 70 years ago, that's, that's a no-no in disrespecting the flag. Now, I mean, you know, that symbol, which is a very important symbol to us, we use in all sorts of ways. And, you know, um, I guess e even more uh, recently, the blue line, the blue lives matter flag or whatever, um, it's just another version of doing something to the flag like that, which would have been seen as disrespectful a while ago. And now it's kind of back to that um, as, as really, I just read an interesting article the other day about it being connected to uh, white supremacy and, and uh, a threatening to communities of color and things like that. Oh, oh I, got a, I got a text back. I got a text back. Maybe I'll wait till the end to read it to you. All right. <laughs> look at everybody like, oh. Okay, so culture and language. So the first one, symbols, right? The second thing out of those four things that all culture shares, uh, language, right? Officially, it's a set of symbols uh, that expresses ideas and enables people to think and communicate with one another. So this makes sense. Um, American Sign Language, I wish I knew American Sign Language because um, that is a universal language. Uh, so language can be though a system of verbal, nonverbal, and written representations rooted within a particular culture. Um, and when a language is lost, then it can represent the erasure of history and knowledge in an entire culture. Um, and for cultures, now what cultures would that happen to? Well, many native cultures were passing down traditions orally. 
And so people were identifying in the 40s and 50s and 60s that some of those languages and those tribes were going extinct because of the inability to preserve language being like, you know, one of the big reasons for that. So it enables communications, it illuminates beliefs and practices, it roots a community in its environment, um, it contributes to the cultural richness of the world. I love language. Like anytime somebody comes up with a new version of a word, okay, so this word has been out for a while, but I love it, manscaping, right? Like I'm, I'm, so I'm a huge fan of like play on words, creating words from other words and just watching language change. Uh, the band that I'm in is called Musketeer Gripweed. It's a kind of a nod to um, John Lennon, but who used the words musketeer anymore? Like, you know, like there are certain words that if we don't use them, if cultures don't use them and they disappear, you know, I mean, think about this. This is something that I was thinking about too, Fortnite, right? Like, unless you were into like Jane Austen, uh, you know, or books, books like Pride and Prejudice, you might not know what a fortnight is. Um, but now suddenly people know what a fortnight is through like a video game or something like that. So to me, language is always really interesting, um, an important part of culture. Yeah, exactly. Fortnite, right. Very common in the UK. Exactly. And, and disappears in, in other ways in other cultures. All right. So Safir Whorf hypothesis this is an important one to understand. Um, language shapes the view of the reality of its speakers, right? So if you were raised, right, speaking English in the United States, um, or whether you were born in, in uh, Scotland or what, how, whatever that might be, uh, Australia, the way that language is used around you has contributed to shaping your reality. And I think that that's really interesting um, because we understand the world through this cultural lens of language, right? Um, everything emerges from language, words and concepts, they structure, right? Um, our entire perception of our social world. So to me, and, and again, the fact that that is really like changing also is also the thing that I just said, you know, that's very interesting to me about language. Um, you know, something that was said a long time ago, maybe it's morphed into something completely different. Maybe somebody has taken a word and made it their own in which it was a word that was used in a different way or a derogatory term. Anyway, it is the lens through which we understand our world. So the worlds in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same worlds with different labels attached. So like another name to a country. No, that entire language, that entire culture, is very connected to their own language and thus very it's a very big has a very big impact on, on our when, when i say it shapes our reality it's kind of like a big deal right because if you think about sitting in a class with 150 or 200 people or 10 people i mean your reality is different than the person next to you different next to you next to you or the people in your dorm room or the people you're at in a restaurant and yet there's the uh, at least thought for structural functionalism would be, and yet this all still continues to go on, right? Even though our realities can be shared and so very different. All right, next would be values and beliefs. So symbols, uh, symbols, values and belief and language, uh, things that are common components to all cultures. So values, Right? Ideas are general standards, these general ideas about what is right or wrong, good or bad, desirable, or undesirable in a culture. And maybe in addition to that, these culturally defined standards, you know, that people use. What is good? What is beautiful? What serves as a broad guideline? So, you know, when I talk about beliefs, those are things that are more specific. When I talk about values, that's this big idea, right? National or patriotic values community values, family values, right? Um, and of course, depending on who's using that term and where they're using it and in what context, it could mean something very, very, very different, right? Um, but consider values a statement of what ought to be. So if I ask about values, uh, you know, a statement of what ought to be, right? So standards, what is right and wrong, what we consider to be right and wrong. And, and, you know, these are, are pretty important to us. 
And like anything else, just like these two pictures of minors from the 1920s and some you know young adults up against a wall enjoying their phones, working hard uh, in the 19 whatevers or 2000 whatevers. Um, sometimes things stay the same about people and culture and values, sometimes they change. So uh, key values of the United States culture looked at equal opportunity, individual achievement, personal success, material comfort, activity and work, progress, science, democracy and free enterprise, freedom, and racism and group superiority. Just because it's a cultural value doesn't mean it's right or doesn't mean it's correct, but you can look at, at how a society is structured and say, well, if it is structured in this way, then they must value group superiority or they must value racism or they must value gender inequality if they know that it's unequal and they've done nothing about it. Maybe that's right a value. So what do you think about this list? Do we still value these things? Um, do we not? How do you think it's changed over time? What do you think? I don't exactly think equal opportunity is very extremely valued. I know that everybody talks about the American dream a lot, but like, especially after the most recent stock market thing, like that, that really like opened my eyes to like, damn, this shit's kind of rigged, you know? <laughs> like, yes, uh, I don't, I don't know how to, I couldn't have said it better. Um, and they know it is, and it's rigged for rich folks and rich white males usually. Um, and, and, and so the, this is why I love this. This is why I love this so much. I don't need to talk about GameStop, but thank you, your generation for being like, you know what, we're getting involved. And it would be nice to think that, yeah, just anybody could either throw away their money. Well, anybody could throw away their money, but make money in some of those ways that are for other people, but not for others. Um, so yeah, yep. Um, yeah, that's, it's, yep, very interesting thing that's happening right now. Uh, good. And, and equal opportunity in general. Do we really value equal opportunity? What are we doing? And then I guess the question is, if we say we are, what are we doing working towards making sure of that? Or what have we done to prove that we're not interested in working towards equality? And I think that you could find some things, a multitude of things uh, that, that might show either. Good. Uh, what else? Anybody else on here? Things that you feel shouldn't be here are. Um, I would say science, at least in the last four years, wasn't entirely valued as much because of our leadership. So like if you, I mean, my parents are Republican and they did not take COVID serious when it first came out because of the way President Trump handled it. And so I wouldn't say entirely as a whole, the U.S. has valued science as much as it should have been valued and it can be valued. Yep. And I think you said that in the gentlest way possible, you know, um, yeah, you know, and when you're given that information at just how serious it is and you purposely don't share it with people, then we're in the territory of criminal negligence to the tune of what's going on right now with a Pearl Harbor a day of people dying. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Science would come in very important there. And actually what we've heard is from people working those positions like Dr. Fauci, whatever, that yeah, you weren't able to bring scientific things to the table. And furthermore, non-scientific based things were brought to the table frequently in place of science. And I would say during a global pandemic, there's never been a more dangerous time to turn away from science. Um, so that's, you know, I think a positive direction um, that we can look at right now. Uh, what else in this list? I think number 10 is starting to be valued more. Okay. Um, so yeah, certainly we will take time to talk about this um, in just about every chapter when we talk about inequality, discrimination of some sort. But yeah, we have seen a rise over the past, and, and there was a, a, a decline for the longest time in, in the viability of groups like the Ku Klux Klan and you know, white supremacist organizations, and now um, an upswing. And hopefully, like we see a lot in history, hopefully there is a very sharp downswing 
um, to domestic terrorism because racism has turned from racism, which has probably always been terrorism, but not defined as such into a whole new territory for sure. Yeah, um, if people do that, if more and more people support those theories, then maybe we could say that, yeah, that's people are valuing that a bit more. Um, <clears throat> and of course, something to keep in mind is that, you know, some of these things at times more and some of these times less. I mean, I think we really value material comfort right now, but I'm not sure how much people value like hard work. And I'm not, I don't want to sound old because I teach. So I am, I am not out there digging ditches. I am not out there roofing and I don't do really, really hard physical jobs. So I don't necessarily speak to that, but I think a work or a work ethic somehow connected to material comfort has likely changed a bit. Right. Good. Um, okay. Uh, so I think I will stop the share here and pause for a minute. Um, any questions? Yes, we will have class on Friday. I will make an announcement about it, but I know that uh, the first content is due and I want to finish lecturing on this chapter on culture. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm going back to languages, but do you believe in the five love languages? I'm not sure I know what that is. All right. Well, <clears throat> do I believe that there are five languages of love? Or is that a thing? There, yeah. So there's like a couple books on it. I mean, I'm not the person who asked the question, but I've read part of the book and the five love languages are like how people like express their love and how you should oh. express it to them. So there's touch, gifts, um, acts of service, quality time, words of affirmation. And so everybody's got like a top three and that's how, you know, a lot of people based on their relationships, like I'll even do that. Like if someone I'm dealing with really values touch, I'll be sure to show them that I love them by giving them a hug. Or if it's words of affirmation, like tell them like, love you, care about you <laughs> or gifts, give them a gift. So. Um, I think that is awesome. Yep. Yeah. I do that with learning styles, but no, I, now, now see, this is the great part about teaching and working with so many fantastic human beings is that at, oftentimes after class, it's like right to go like what I can learn or read about that you've like mentioned or something interesting like that to me. So cool. Um, uh, awesome. All right. Well, that's it uh, for today. Uh, be good people and do good things. Thanks for being here. We will meet Friday. I'll put that up in the announcements. Remember, or did I get a response? I did get a response. All right. All right. All right. How many people are here to see the response? Oh, 58 or something. Okay. I love you and hope your day goes better. Could there be a nicer person on the face of the earth? Look at uh, my face is so red right now because I am so embarrassed. Like, look at me. She's so nice. I'm, I'm so horrible. Oh my gosh. I, I, now I'm going to tell her and either she's just like, dude's got class because she, because she hears me down here talking or she's just like, probably what the truth is. She's the nicest person in the world. So I'm going to go apologize to the nicest person in the world and, uh, and, and thank her for being so awesome. And uh, so every, oh, I'll, I'll explain. I'll, of course, I'll explain. Hey, I've, I've been with the same person for 25 years. I know how to communicate. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Be good people and do good things. I'll see you on Friday. That's awesome. Fun class today. Fun thank, class. You. Yep, take care. thank you. Thank you.